Welcome to Your Vote Counts, candidate interviews sponsored by Capital Community TV and the League of Women Voters of Marion and Polk Counties. My name is Diana Bodker and I am a member of the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that works to educate ourselves and the public about government issues and civic responsibilities. In this program, we will present the candidates for the Legislative House District 25. They are alphabetically Dave McCall and Bill Post. Our format for this program is as follows. Each candidate has three minutes to give an opening statement outlining their background, qualifications, and top priorities if elected. Following that, each candidate will be given one and a half minutes to answer questions that have been prepared by the League members on current issues. The candidates were not given the questions ahead of time. At the end, the candidates will have two minutes to make a closing statement in which to state the legacy they would like to leave if elected to that office. Seating was not designated and question response order will rotate. We will begin with Mr. McCall as candidate A for his opening remarks. Thank you, Diana. My name is Dave McCall, a proud citizen of Kaiser, and I love all of the District 25. I have traveled much of it as my job working for Oregon Armored. I was the branch manager and had to deal with the customers and providing a good service. What I have seen, and as you probably noticed, I am not a professional politician, but what I've seen and what I've heard from my neighbors and my friends are issues that are just not being addressed in our legislature today and in the last few years. Those being funding for our schools, improvement of our education. We need our young people to be properly educated and given the chance to succeed. Our infrastructure needs to be fully funded and bring new energy sources to our state in such as renewable energy sources, which will bring Oregon in the forefront of a new energy economy. All right, Mr. Post. Thank you, Diane. Well, mm -hmm. if you live in Kaiser, St. Paul, or Newburgh, you know that I've been your state representative for the last four years, and I have been honored and privileged to do that. It's been uh, a learning uh, <laughs> procedure. Every day I learn something new. Uh, you, my background, uh, many people know, but for those who don't, my background is about 40 years in the broadcast business. Uh, radio, television, and a little bit of newspaper. And in that, in analyzing Oregon politics for years on the radio and television, I felt like the citizens' legislature had no longer been the citizens' legislature which is really what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Next, you're it. And instead what I saw was people were staying for years and years and years and years. And I bring that up today in this forum because I actually hesitated about running again for a third term. Because I think uh, term limits, though I don't agree with term limits, I think self-term limits are important. And I had to think really long and hard about this running again because I thought I don't want to become one of them that stays there for 12 and 15 and 20 and 35 years. But after some talk with friends and family and some constituents from all around the district, um, they encouraged me to give it another shot. And so I am. Because I have unfinished business, I have bills that I just came that close to pushing across the finish line. Some bills that I did pass, but some bills that I still, I want to finish. So we're going to come at them again if I'm reelected. And uh, they're bills that will help agriculture in our community, help small businesses, and generally get government out of the way and let the people do what they do best, which is prosper, if they're allowed to prosper. So I'm asking that you vote for me one more time in this 2018 election coming up on November 6th and we'll have more discussion in just a little bit, but I, I greatly appreciate CCTV and the League of Women Voters for putting this on again this year, so thank you very much. All right, we will begin the questions, mm. and you will start, Mr. Post. All right. What do you recommend to make Oregon's infrastructure and population more resilient to seismic, flood, and wildfire disasters? 
Wow. There, we, get, we have a lot of talk in the Capitol about the big one, the Cascadia. And so that's the first thing that comes to my mind is thinking about the Cascadia. I serve on uh, right now, the, uh, it's called the Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee. And so we talk a lot about veterans, but we spend quite a bit of time on emergency preparedness. And this state is not ready for the big one. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure what all it's going to take for the big one, because there were people who came into our committee that frankly, from, from the state agencies, uh, told us stories that I remember sitting at the dais with my colleagues and we looked at each other and said, are any of us gonna actually make it? It was that dire. Mm. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. And uh, I'm not even sure where to start. It's such a massive topic. Uh, but I think that we will address it. I know it's being talked about in our committee and it's gonna be talked about again uh, in the legislature in 2019, as far as I know. So I, I, I actually can't answer that because that is such a broad question that I don't know that I can narrow it down to any one. There's several topics there that we could spend hours on. Sure. Mm. Mr. McCall. Well, thanks, Diane. Well, this is a very interesting conversation and subject because yes, it is something that we all think about in the back of our minds. When is it going to happen to us? In last year's legislative session, SB 50, I do believe, was to create a comprehensive, integrated information system to help coordinate our local, county, and state resources in the case of an emergency. I find it perplexing that some people don't seem to remember it or voting no against it. But it did pass and it is a system that is now going to start being in place. I am relieved of that, at least something is being done. But I do believe more could be done. Because if we look at our road system right now, how many of our bridges are close to collapse? They have been designated as such by ODOT, by the US government. If we have a particular emergency, we wouldn't want to be on those bridges trying to escape only to find ourselves in a bigger problem. So this would be something in a transportation system and bill that I would look forward to. All right, thank you. Mr. McCall, after several years with the coordinated care model for the Oregon Health Plan, what is your opinion of its implementation and would you propose any changes statewide? Oh, this is a good one. Uh, because so many people have proposed so many different things uh, in regarding to the Oregon Health Plan. Where do we start? Um, that particular one, I am not familiar with. I will become more familiar with it because there are, as Mr. Post has also said, as a legislature, you don't read all the bills because there's just so many of them and no one can be an expert on all of them. But as far as the Oregon Health Plan goes, I know of people who are on it, who have received good benefits from it. There are limitations. Um, they did that, in, created that in order to help save costs by making certain electives, uh, surgeries off the table. But unfortunately, some people have slipped through it, the long lines, the, the time it takes in order to get your service. Uh, can be horrendous and you can go without your medication. I would see that those that are in desperate need are the ones who are moved up in a priority. All right. Thank you. Mr. Post. Thanks. The CCOs I think are, are, are working correctly. I think they're, they're working the way they should. I can only use um, personal experience when it comes to, for instance, the Oregon Health Plan. Um, I cannot believe it's been 18 years, but 18 years ago, I used to run a program from Northwest Medical Teams that provided free dental care. We, we called them the dental vans. There were nine, eight or nine of them around the state of Oregon. And we would drive that dental van into an area. And we had a couple of requirements. To be able to be served on the dental van, you had to not be uh, fortunate enough to have health insurance, but you also had to be not eligible for the Oregon Health Plan. 
so I bring that up because we had this huge group of people that we served that were in the middle. They were not poor enough to be on the Oregon Health Plan. They were not wealthy enough to have their own insurance. Those are the people that I'm kind of concerned about, those folks that are in the middle that just make enough, but not enough, if that makes sense. So I, I think there needs to be something still done with the Oregon Health Plan and some revamping on that. But again, it's not one of my areas of expertise. It is definitely not in my wheelhouse. Um, I serve on committees that have nothing to do with health plans. I'm on judiciary, veterans, and emergency preparedness, and economic development. So it's, you kind of stick with what you know uh, to get through in the legislature. Thank you. Do you think, Mr. Post, that the balance between individual and corporate taxes is appropriate? And would you please relate this to your vision of an ideal Oregon tax structure? Hmm. I will make so many people that are on my side of the aisle angry when I say this because I, I, I just I don't care. Um, I, I am in favor of some sort of a sales tax, VAT tax, something with a huge but on that. And the but would be one of the other two legs of the stool has to come off. And it has to come off permanently because I don't trust the legislature 20 years from now. If, they, if tomorrow we remove the property tax leg, let's say, and implement sales tax, I don't trust that 20 years from now some legislature says, yeah, well, we think we should put the, that leg back on the stool. So I would like to me, a sales tax is you consume, you pay tax. You don't consume, you don't pay tax. It's a real simple way to go about it. Obviously, I wouldn't want food and necessary items to be taxed. Uh, but that, to me, would be the ideal, ideal way to go. I don't know that we'll ever get there in Oregon because Oregonians, like self-serve gas, they don't like a sales tax. So I, that one's going to be unpopular. All right. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Well, I agree. That would probably be very unpopular, but it'd also be... Uh, highly improbable through the state legislature. Uh, a lot of our taxes, particularly how our property taxes are formulated, are constitutional. So we would need a constitutional measure in order to change our tax system. I would like to see a closing of those gaps. Everyone should pay their fair share. We have always been, or at least I was raised, that we don't like taxes but we should pay our fair share. And some people are overtaxed and some people are undertaxed. This should be thoroughly reformed. Uh, closing structures, particularly what is sad to say is large worldwide corporations have occasionally used blackmail in order to say, give us a tax break or we will leave. This is wrong. This is not morally justifiable, not to mention it loses money for our state services. And that's where it is. Any kind of tax, if, if Mr. Post would like to propose a sales tax, I would like to see one other caveat on that, that it be designated where it goes to, not just simply into the general fund. All right. Mr. McCall, since you, you're up next, are you satisfied with the redistricting process in Oregon, and are you interested in suggesting reforms? Well, there's always something to complain about our uh, districting system. It's hard to imagine that someone who has a vested interest in how a district is done and occupies that district would not want it shaped to favor them or favor a particular party. When I was going to Western uh, University over here in Monmouth, I took political science. So I often talk to my political science professors about such subjects. And one of them uh, I brought up, and they thought it was a novel idea. I don't know if it'll uh, go through, but have each district represent what the state is as a whole. Right now, the state constitution says it's X number of people per district. It doesn't say what kind of people. It doesn't say what party they belong to. But if each one of the districts represented the, what, the same percentage as the state is as, as a whole, as per party or affiliation, then the parties themselves, mine included, would have to work 
probably harder to win certain seats because it would be an even match every time. All right, Mr. Post. Well, the last time redistricting was done was in 2010, after the 2010 census, it'll happen again in 2020, so 2021 will be the next redistricting period. Uh, I have been very vocal in being in support of a, I don't wanna say bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. I want a nonpartisan group of citizens, not legislators, not politicians, citizens to discern, determine these lines. I have seen what's happened with the districts. I'm gonna give a couple of examples. One of the ones that's one of the craziest districts I've ever seen is House District 23. To get the population that it needs to have, it has to put fingers into every little area to get enough people into that district. So you have a, a, a district that's based in Dallas, Oregon, that has people in Jefferson, Oregon, that has people on the Oregon coast, that has people down in Monroe, that has people up near McMinnville. It's a crazy district. You look at the Eugene area. There are five districts around there. Each one has a finger that goes into downtown Eugene. Why is that? So redistricting, because it's been partisan all these years, it's time to have a nonpartisan redistricting process. And so I think there'll be a bill, I've heard rumors that there'll be a bill coming up in 2019 to bring this about. It's gotta be nonpartisan, not bipartisan, nonpartisan which is gonna to be tough to do in Oregon, but I think it needs to be done. If people understand that there are 60 House districts, 30 Senate districts, and right now five congressional districts, and I believe because of our population growth, we're going to get a sixth congressional district. Where will that sixth congressional district be? That's a huge question. All right, thank you. Mr. Post, in your view, what is the legislature's role in combating climate change? How high is it on your legislative priority list? I've had this, this discussion with so many people, especially uh, my colleagues in the legislature. And look, who doesn't want clean water, clean air, clean environment? We have that in Oregon right now. I, I think we're one of the leaders in environmental, keeping the environment clean and livable and sustainable. I think we do a great job of that. When I see things like a cap and trade, a cap and invest, a cap and whatever you wanna call it, things like that, and I realize that if tomorrow we were to eliminate one million percent of all the emissions in Oregon, it would be a blip about that big on the world scale. So until we get the rest of the world to get on board with cutting emissions, I don't know how one state on the west coast of America is going to change the world, but it's good to have high hopes, and so um, I guess that's what we'll continue to do. All right, Mr. McCall. Well, I have a slight problem with that. One, uh, cap and trade is not such a bad idea. It allows invest into uh, new clean systems for our businesses. This benefits our ben uh, benefits, our uh, particular benefit. Uh, I can't say the word, uh, business and commerce. What is the problem in some of these approaches is using a stick instead of using the carrot. If we use the, uh, the carrot, the reward for our businesses, our farmers, our neighborhoods to switch to a better, cleaner system, instead of punishing you use it as a reward, like taking off your tax breaks, you know, making a tax break. What, yes, if Oregon is the only one that goes 100% clean, is that going to make a big impact on the world? Well, no. Anyone with common sense would tell you no. But that's not a good enough reason to say why we can't try. Other states are also working at it. Other countries are working at it. To say we can't try is the same thing as a child saying, well, I can't write this. Well, work at it, do it, be patient. We can all get there. All right, thank you very much. All right, our next question, Mr. McCall. Traffic congestion is an increasing problem in Oregon <coughs> metropolitan areas. What measures to address this issue have you considered? Oh, it's, it's not just our metropolitan areas. Uh, when I worked for Oregon Armored for all those years, I drove a truck. I drove an armored truck. And I went through five different counties. So I saw 
even on our county highways, the congestion that we can have. This is a solvable problem. It's, all we have to really do is invest in the infrastructure that we need to have. And it's not just traveling from, to school or traveling to your work. It also is our businesses, our commerce, need transportation to bring their goods to market. A farmer cannot bring his crops to a market without good transportation. We have, in some places, uh, invested in transportation zones, which are for our businesses, and to help them uh, get tax breaks or other limitations on any kind of re regulation. We should improve upon that so we can have a prosperous state. Mr. Post. Well, because House District 25 is mainly a rural district, I, I, I tend to try to think more along the lines of what's good for my district. Um, so I want to bring out a couple of issues concerning transportation in our district. Uh, the St. Paul Highway, Highway 219, uh, French Prairie, uh, there's uh, Miguel, uh, Ellen Road, uh, McKay Road, there's several roads out there that there's some serious issues going on and we've had to address it so I was able to work with the St. Paul Mayor this year to get a four-way stop at what is now a three-way stop and it, a lot of accidents happen there because people fly through there not knowing that you're supposed to stop at that one and not stop at that one. So we're working on that. The Newburgh-Dundee bypass was huge to the people of Newburgh. Phase one, I would like to see phase two built and eventually phase three and phase four and get the thing completed, which would alleviate so much traffic in Newburgh. Um, I'd like to see something done about the third bridge in Salem. I'm not sure who gets to do that. Is it the city of Salem? Is it Marion County? Is it the state of Oregon? Uh, so there's a lot of topics around that. But I voted no on HB 2017, the transportation package, because of a couple of reasons, mainly because, for instance, the vehicle privilege tax, as it's called, the half a percent that was taxed on every new vehicle that's sold is given back as a credit to buy an electric car. That's not going to roads and bridges. No roads and bridges are being repaired by that half a percent tax. So that's why I voted no. All right. Mr. Post, you're closing. Oh, it's closing time already. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I believe Mr. McCall starts. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't have mind, Bill, if you wanted to go first. <laughs> what I want to bring forward in a future for our area, our communities, our district, is some of the things that have not been discussed here. One of them is our failing schools. Newburgh alone has a million dollar loss and there has been no discussion in the state legislature. Our representatives have failed us by not bringing forward any legislation in order to help his schools that are in his district, our district. It's our government. Our government should be working for us not for any particular person or institution or group, but all of us because we're all in the same boat together. I would like to see better transportation. I would like to see the completion of our projects. Let's move it forward. Let's get our companies moving. Let's get our business moving. Let's grow our economy. And I'd like to see it done in a clean, healthy, renewable energy source that we can be the new energy exporter for our area, for the Pacific Northwest, maybe even internationally. We can do this if we have the will, and I do believe Oregonians do have the will. Best people I know are Oregonians we pull together. When we have something we set in our minds, we can do it. And I would like to help lead that in the legislature. Thank you. Mr. Post. Thank you. 
Diana, and I appreciate, again, CCTV and League of Women Voters for putting on these forums every year. They put a lot of work into this. So once again, I, I've served for what will now be four years at the end of this year as state representative for Kaiser, St. Paul, Newburgh, and the rural areas around those three towns. Um, I simply ask this, if you're satisfied with the representation you've had, I would ask for you to vote for me again. Uh, I appreciate every single person in the district. And I, my favorite thing about being a, a state representative, and I, I even hesitate to use that, that title because it, it's, it, I'm just another person. But what I like about it is it gives me the door into state agencies. Probably the number one thing that, that I enjoy doing as a state representative is helping constituents get through the maze and the tunnels that are state agencies. When they call me and they say, Representative Post, can you help me talk to Agency X? I can't seem to get through to them. That's where we get in. And so I really I, I enjoy doing that. And I'm glad that um, people get a hold of our office and ask for that. So we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to stand up against big government. We'll st continue to stand up for agriculture, for small businesses, and for individuals in the, Salem, in the uh, Kaiser, St. Paul, and Newburgh areas. So once again, I appreciate you watching this, and I appreciate you being with us today, and I ask that you vote for me. My website is billpost.us. You can go there and learn more. Thank you. This is all the time we have. You have been watching Your Vote Counts candidate interviews for Legislative House District 25 with Mr. Dave McCall and Mr. Bill Post. We hope you will watch our other candidate forums and please see CCTV website for time and dates. These forums are a public service to voters to become more acquainted with candidates who hope to lead our city, county, and state governments in the coming years. The last day to register to vote or make changes to your registration is October 16th. Ballots will be mailed on or about October 17th and should be returned by November 6th at 8 p.m. Postmarks do not count. We urge you to make democracy work and be a voter. This is Diana Bodker for the League of Women Voters and CCTV thanking you for watching Your Vote Counts.